All right, hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are watching a virtual program organized by the East Baton Rouge Parish Library with Little Wars. Um, this program is live and we would love it if you would leave your questions in the chat. Um, so welcome to There's a Game for Everyone with Little Wars. Um, I'm Darcy from the main library and tonight we're going to hear about some great games for different ages from Little Wars owner and resident game expert Van Bill. Van, how's it going tonight? It's going pretty good, you know, um, it's a good time for playing games. I actually just came from a trip where I played a ton of board games, so this will be very fresh on my mind. Uh, yes, exactly. That's great. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your store and the cool stuff you guys get up to there? Oh, cool. Um, so uh, my name is Van. I have been an avid gamer for the majority of my life, um, and uh, I own Little Wars. So I'm only the third owner to own it. Little Wars has actually been in Baton Rouge since 1987, so before I was yeah. born. Yeah, it's been here for a long time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I started going to Little Wars whenever I was in middle school, thereabouts. My brother would bring me there, and uh, I just really loved it. Uh, I met most of my current lifelong friends there and uh just there's something about gaming in person that i've always really enjoyed so um yeah so, uh, now that i own it it's it's definitely interesting to be on the you know the other side of the curtain but <laughs> i believe I, it yeah i still get to i still get to hang out with everybody and we still all play games together and have a good time and you know that's part of the fun is organizing a community that really is passionate about what they're doing um, Absolutely. Super agree. Mm -hmm. So you have planned to tell us about a bunch of cool games tonight. Do we want to like roll straight into that? Yeah, let's do it. Um, so I believe today was uh, Games by Ages. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, so I prepared a little PowerPoint presentation. Now, um, I haven't actually made a PowerPoint in probably over a decade. So <laughs> just uh, <laughs> it might look a little rudimentary, but we'll go ahead, we'll go ahead and pull it up here. It'll be delightful. <laughs> Take a look at it. That's great. Oh yeah, you know, I put a little starburst in the corner. I figured that'll, uh, you know, nice. show everybody's eyes. So today was uh, Games by Ages. So when you guys approached me and you're like, hey, you know, these are some categories we're thinking about. Um, I honestly felt that it was a fun challenge because it's not often that we try to break these board games or games by these categories. So um, this this was an interesting look. So the first category is actually probably one of the easiest was uh, games for kids because this is a very big question that I get all the time mm -hmm. by, by people who come in, right? They're like, oh, you know, I want, I want a game that I can play with my kids. Um, so this was, this was pretty good. So our first game um, is one of the games that I really enjoyed recommending for people. It just came out, I think, last year. Um, it's a game called Chop Chop. Uh, it's by a company called Jekko. I, I believe they're a French company and they make a bunch of games that are, are very accessible for everybody. Um, so with sure. Chop Chop, I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna describe it a little bit. Um, okay. So the reason, one of the reasons why I recommended this game for uh, families that have younger kids is for two reasons. Whenever, whenever I'm looking for games for kids, I, I think about, um, reading comprehension being being a thing and then uh just just how accessible it's going to be so with chop chop there there is no uh kind of difficult reading that needs to be done we have some numbers on a dice and we have a very simple concept so one player plays the cat and all the other players play the mice so there's going to be four mice and a cat uh and the cat's goal is to try to capture all the mice and the mice's the mice's the mice's goal is to <laughs> uh, find all the cheese in the kitchen before they're all captured, and then uh, and get back get back to their their mouse hole. So um, for this one, I actually have uh, a copy of the game here. So I thought that we would maybe look at some of the components. So yeah, absolutely. I can describe. This. I'm gonna switch my camera over here, and we can take a look. So here we go. Do I have to like? Do I do something here? To... <laughs> oh. Perfect. Oh, Delightful. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So I have, a, I have a physical copy of the game here. Uh, so another reason why I recommended this game for uh, families is that it's very aesthetically pleasing, uh, in my opinion. And I, I find that does a better job at keeping the attention of kids. Um, so first off, we have a very 
robust, I like to say, game components. So they're, they're resilient to damage. <laughs> Good for being chewed on. <laughs> yeah, right. So we have a we have a mouse die and a cat die. They're made from wood, so they're oh. they're pretty they're pretty stable and they're large. So it's uh, it's hard for you to accidentally eat them, <laughs> uh, which is, is the big. <laughs> Important for small children. It's important for small children. And then the second thing we have, uh, we have these game pieces. So we have a cat here. I guess I'll put this up to the oh, camera wow. here. A little cat mini. And we have, and we have the mice. They're so cute. They're so detailed. <laughs> yeah. And uh, these pieces are made out of rubber. So once again, very resilient to kind of uh, wear and tear and damage. And then we have the big tiles and stuff themselves. Uh, so these are the tiles for the for the mouse hole. Uh, that mm -hmm. the mice the mice come out of and then we have the kitchen tiles for uh the game itself so these tiles are, are actually going to be face down on the kitchen and then as the mice land on them they'll flip over and we get to see what it does so sometimes it's just like a broken plate or a fork and uh i think the mice get caught on the forks and then there's a <laughs> so, so they can't move for one turn right they just kind of get hung up on it and then uh there's a couple of other tiles that let them move extra spaces um, so this is what the board looks like. It's uh, here, so you can see there's a bunch of spaces in the board mm -hmm. or uh, pieces that will go face down. And you notice that there's four pegs here. So one of the coolest, and in my opinion, most aesthetically pleasing parts of the game is that it comes with a table, like an actual wooden <laughs> table uh, that you, that you oh put together. So you would, um, and what's interesting about this table gameplay wise is that the cat um can move on top of the table so the cat kind of has free reign to travel uh anywhere on the board because the table's there but it can't go under the table so the mice can actually oh. sit under the table and take refuge there oh that's um, adorable yeah oh it's, a, it's, it's really cool and um another thing that i like about this game is that you can play with just two people or you can play with five because you have up to four mice and even if a mouse uh, gets captured, the mice players control all the mice. So you can actually just all control the same mouse. So you're never actually out of the game, even if you uh, are eliminated, uh, as it were. So. Okay, so it's it's like cooperative then, at yeah. least for the mice. <laughs> yeah, so there's a, there's a fun, like there's a cooperative concept for the players that are playing the mice um, because they uh, have to work together and they can control the same mice and they can even talk about it, right? So like, if it's my turn, I would roll the uh, I would roll the mouse movement die and then I would be like, oh, okay. So I roll the four, um, you know, which mouse do you think I should move to try to get away from this cat? You know, like, so this, this mouse is obviously farther away. So the cat would have to roll higher to get to it. And this mouse is closer. So maybe I'll just move this one and, uh, you know, travel around to pick up some things. So, and that's really the whole game in a nutshell. Um, so it's very simple and easy to understand. Uh, usually I've found that what the parents like to do with their kids is they like to have their kid play as the cat because I think that's a, that's a more straightforward and uh, easy to understand game plan, right? So you're just trying to chase and capture, capture the mice and then they'll play as the mice to try to scatter, scurry around and uh, mm -hmm. pick up stuff. So, yeah, and that's, that's Chop Chop. Uh, I think that it's it's a it's a great game. Like I said, it's really good for kids. Uh, it might be a game that would be less entertaining for adults in the long run. You know, like I, mm -hmm. I don't think that it has really good replayability in that vein. But if you have young kids and you know they and you want to be able to play a game with them and get them into some critical thinking uh, earlier on, I think that it's a really good game for that. It's really cute. I really like the idea of having having the kid play as the cat and then like as they get better at it, they can maybe try being the mouse and like, hey, you have to communicate with your, you know, whoever you're playing with to actually get good stuff done or the cat is going to get you. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it really, it really incorporates both elements. And uh, there's, there's this feeling of camaraderie because like after three of your mice buddies get caught, you're like, oh man, you know, like this is it. Like we gotta, we gotta make it happen. So um, no, it's, 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 a it's a great little game. Um, I think there's, uh, there's some extra rules in here as well if you wanted to make it a little bit more complex with the tiles because the tiles do a little extra stuff so i mean but other than that that's the main course of of chop chop nice and easy very simple they don't have to do any reading mm -hmm. um, so that's why you can play it with like very young kids they just have to understand what numbers are and uh, kind of recognize some symbols and then the basic concept of 
not getting captured by a cat or, you know, <laughs> finding food, you know, finding cheese and bringing it home is a big deal. So, yeah. Adorable. And that's it. Yeah. So cute. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a couple of other games in the kids categories too. So mm -hmm. uh, I think we'll take a, we'll take a look at some of those now. Let's see. Ooh. Okay. So I don't have physical copies of some of these other games, but I, I did include kind of a explanation for it. So our second game here is called Spot It. Um, this game has been very, very popular amongst, uh, you know, families far and wide in my, uh, mm -hmm. the, the reason is that it's just, it's a, it's, it's a fun little pattern matching game. It's very fast and, and quick and easy to set up. So it's, it's, uh, I, I know people who will play this game in between their bigger, more complicated games, cause it's just fast and easy. So I guess we'll move over to the next slide here and maybe take a look at. Uh, what I had put. Yeah, okay. So um, as you can see, the tin just comes with a bunch of round cards. And those cards all have a bunch of different symbols on them. Uh, in the picture on the right, you'll see that sometimes there's just words as well. And what's interesting is that each one of these cards has a symbol that matches another symbol on one of the other cards, but only one. So okay. there are so in this tin in particular, there are 55 cards. Each card has only one matching symbol with, uh, with all, the, all the other cards in the tin. So in order to play a game of Spot It, you usually each have a card. So if you look here on the right, you'll each have a card and then there'll be one card in the center. And the first person that can find the image that matches their card from their card to the card in the center gets to take that card and it becomes their new card, right? And then you just keep going down through the tower and then at the end of the game, whoever has the most cards wins. Um, so That's super cute. It's like, ooh, yeah, like memory matching shenanigans, but also maybe like I spy <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, it's a bit, it's like, it's like I spy. So um, it, it's tricky because uh, even, looking, even looking here, so like between the, uh, like the card on the bottom left and the card in the center, it's it's tricky to find the stuff that matches because they're also they're also different sizes. So like mm -hmm. in, in this case, the matching images to the kumbaya, right? You mm -hmm. can you can see, but they're different, they're different sizes. Uh, so it can be weird to try to find a, a matching image. And yeah, like I said, it's just really it's just really quick and easy. Again, very little reading comprehension necessary. You just tell tell your kids, like, hey, we're just trying to find the thing. And it's fun because we're trying to go as fast as possible. So there's a lot of like combative, uh, oh no, I totally, I totally called mine out first or, uh, or, or that kind of thing. It's like With a friendly it. yelling game. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think one of the best things about Spot It is that it's been around for a very long time and the concept for Spot It is so simple that they actually have a bunch of different versions of Spot It. So there's like a Disney Spot It, there's like Spot It's for different sports um Cute. yeah so they there's a lot of different variations um for for this game that's super cute and it looks really like super portable like easy to wander away with oh yeah play in the car somewhere <laughs> absolutely it's a great it's a great little travel game um i know people like in, in with this image i know people who have taken it to when they go camping and stuff because it's yeah. a it'd be similar to bringing around a, a deck of playing cards or something right mm -hmm. like it's fast and easy and portable but okay, I guess we'll uh, we'll move on to our third game spot for kids. This one is called mm -hmm. Fairy Tile. Fancy. Um, yeah, I wanted to uh, put a game out there for maybe you know the slightly older kids mm -hmm. don't mind a little bit of reading. So Fairy Tile was a game that uh, I I came became savvy to I think maybe two years ago. I like to go to these game conventions where they post the new games that are coming out. And I demoed Fairy Tile and I immediately fell in love with it. I thought it was amazing. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a complex game. You know, it's, it's really uh, a game that I think would be good for kids, but it's also just a good, it, it's a good narrative uh, that, that is created here. So if, if you look at it, first of all, it is so aesthetically pleasing. Um, yeah. <laughs> <It's> lovely. <laughs> Yeah, the art style is wonderful. Um, you have, and it it kind of evokes that feeling of 
a fantasy setting, right? You have a princess, you have a dragon, you have the knight in the background um, pan panning forward. So just really aesthetically beautiful game. Um, I think we move on to the next slide here. We'll take a look at some of the game components. Yeah, so. It's uh, so nice. Yeah, right. Um, it's beautiful game. Uh, so if, if we look at this, it's first off, it's a card game. So like I said, there was a little bit of reading comprehension in this one, but it doesn't take a whole lot. So basically what is happening in fairy tile is you have these three models. You have the dragon, uh, a knight, and the princess. And everybody has their own hand of story cards. And you're trying to make the events of your story card happen, essentially. And it's really cool because the, the story cards in concept are very simple. They're like, oh, well, you need to have the dragon and the princess meet in a castle square, or the knight and the princess need to meet in the forest. Um, so you're kind of creating this narrative of what's happening between these three beings and they're they're listed on your card and you'll, the cards themselves have really cool flavor text um, about like what's happening in, in the story. Like, because uh, like uh, a lot of the cards are like from the knight's perspective, like, oh, I need to protect the princess and, and I need to, I need to, you know, deal with this dragon. And then from like the dragon's perspective, like he's just hanging out and chilling, you know, and he's <laughs> he's like, I don't know why this knight's chasing me. You know, this princess seems really nice. Like the princess and the dragon have like are like really cool, you know, and they're just hanging out and this knight's showing up. So it's just, <laughs> it's fun to, it. <laughs> yeah, it's fun to kind of build your narrative <laughs> as you're playing through the game. Uh, so so there's, there's there's two parts of the the strategy here. Um, first off is you'll you'll notice that the tiles that they're standing on is a map that you build. So you'll see a separate piece. Uh, each of these tiles are three section, uh, three hexes put together. Mm -hmm. And there are certain rules for building your your map as you're as you're putting them together. And then the pieces themselves on top of the map have restrictions on how they can move as well. So the knight always moves two hexes. The dragon moves like a rook from chess. Like he moves all the way to the end of, of a line. And the princess moves one space, but she can also teleport between castles. Oh, so, fine. <laughs> yeah, so a lot, of, a lot of the strategy is how you place your tiles. Mm -hmm. um, hence fairy tile, I suppose. And then um, you're trying to just get these story cards to happen. And the, at the end of the game, the player who... Uh, makes the most story events happen. They collect the most story cards that they've successfully achieved wins the game. Oh, this is super cool. So how do the um, the models move? Like, do the players get to move the models or do they just move automatically after every round? Yeah, uh, so on your turn, you you do two things. You place, you, you draw a new tile, a new three section tile and you place it. Mm -hmm. And then you get to choose one of the three models to move in the capacity that they can. So the knight has to move two spaces if you choose to move the knight. The dragon has to move from one end to another end, and the princess can only move one space or teleport between the castle tiles, but you do both. So you're you're trying to place a tile and then you're trying to move one of the pieces to match one of the one of your story cards. So I think one of the story cards is like the the princess and the dragon are next to each other and the princess has to be in a castle tile and the dragon has to be in a forest tile. Kind of thing so oh, they get they get pretty specific tough. yeah, yeah. <laughs> they get Some pretty specific strategy mm -hmm. i like it this is like it's like cool storytelling group storytelling kind of stuff but like very toned down which i like yeah it's yeah, like absolutely. proto D D for these kids and you're luring luring them in with these adorable models yeah no i um we we had a we had a little demo table for this game whenever it first came out and it was very popular. Just be, people just naturally were drawn to it because like oh this game looks really pretty. Mm -hmm. Tell me how you play it. I'm like well it's just it's very easy. And uh, when they heard that they could play it with their kids, it was it was an easy sell basically. <laughs> like they're like oh yeah. yeah definitely like I want to take this home and <laughs> um, and play with my kids and stuff. Um, so yeah. And that's, that's it. I think that ends our section for uh, Games for Kids. I mean, for all of these, there's limitless. Uh, the world of board games has exploded in the last five years. Like, 
hundreds and hundreds of games come out every month. So <laughs> are you telling me these children don't just have to play Monopoly now? That's right. Yeah. We have more choices Sam. than risk and you know, <laughs> uh, that kind of thing. I love it. But seriously though. So like I work, I work with teens and a lot of times the teens come in and they don't like the only board game they've ever played is Monopoly or like Sorry maybe. So it's super exciting to see that there are so many games for, you know, younger kids and I'm excited to see the teen games. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I guess, I guess what I, you know, I wanted to point out that there's just, there's just so much out there. These were just some of the games that I've curated that I enjoy. Um, but, you know, if you take the time to kind of dig in a little bit, I mean, there's certainly people who are far more board game expert than I am <laughs> in my, in my opinion, like there's, uh, uh, so uh, these are, these are just some of the games that I like. Um, so the games for teens section is fun. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and throw, uh, you know, my recommendation out there for Dungeons and Dragons. I know it's not exactly a board game, it's but, kind of a board game. It's perfect. It's exactly what we want to hear about. It's kind of a board game. Uh, yeah, so it's it's a it's it's kind of a it's a crazy wave right now because more more and more there are parents coming into my store and being like, "Hey, I want to introduce my my kids to D and D role playing games," um, and it's 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 such a big wave because we're kind of getting into the generation where you know the people who played D and D whenever they were teenagers are now having kids right and so there's uh there's this big push for it and it's more popular now than ever especially with like mainstream media adopting it i mean you saw i mean whenever a stranger, stranger things, things was, yeah it was like yeah. a super popular <laughs> thing i sold probably 20 players handbooks just that weekend right <laughs> like people were just coming out of the woodwork to play uh, Dungeons and Dragons. So, but yeah, I just wanted to go ahead and uh, throw it out there for Dungeons and Dragons. Um, realistically, yeah. most role-playing games could work, uh, but Dungeons and Dragons has a special place in the hearts of many gamers, just as being kind of their first role-playing game for a lot of people. And I couldn't, I couldn't recommend fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons enough. Um, because Wizards of the Coast did a fantastic job of making a game that is very accessible. Um, you know, I, I think maybe to the hearts of more uh, experienced role-playing gamers, it might it might be too simple, as they say. Uh, but I think it's I think it's perfect. It it it, it hits a good level of accessibility, yet while still feeling crunchy enough that you can make a, a unique character that that's for you but anyway i'm digressing a bit let's talk <laughs> let's talk about it. dungeons and dragons yeah, yeah let's talk about dungeons yeah. and dragons as a concept okay <laughs> so uh, this this is a, this is a good page um if you're not familiar with D, there's a ton of resources out there um people have been playing slash making resources for D D for so long um so just as a basic concept, if perhaps you're tuning in and you don't know what a role-playing game even is, uh, and, and you've missed this, this wave, uh, Dungeons and & Dragons and other role-playing games is a way to do cooperative storytelling, um, is the way that I like to describe it. So um, there is somebody who governs the, the narrative. Okay, so imagine you were like reading a book and there, there's like a narrator voice that is telling you, you know, like what the setting looks like and, you know, how, uh, you know, how cold it is and, and just everything that these players are, are, the characters are experiencing, there's a player that does that. So that, that person is called the game master or for in D&D's case, the dungeon master. Um, <laughs> and... <laughs> They they play the universe. They play the chorus. They play the impartial impartial being that <laughs> <laughs> dictates what happens. Um, and the players that are playing are essentially the main characters of this story. And the reason why I call it cooperative storytelling is because the narrator isn't telling the players what to do. Um, the players tell the narrator what they want to do, and the narrator then we weave, weaves a story with that information right so 
there's a lot of input from all sides. Uh, Choose reason- your own adventure writ large. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, it, you really can do whatever it is that you want to do uh, in the game. And the reason why they call it a game is because they use rules to govern um, what what happens. Uh, but yeah, real quick, let me let me talk about this talk about this slide. Um, this will be this is our only D and D slide anyway. So, uh, so with our with the extra D and D resources, like I was talking about, there's a lot of stuff out there for if you want to dig into this kind of game. Um, so I, I've pointed out Drive Through RPG. Uh, they're a great resource for just getting your hands on different modules and books. They basically do they're a print on demand service that works with a lot of publishers who don't necessarily want to print a bunch of copies of their stuff. They basically sell it to drive through RPG and drive through RPG will print all of their books on demand. So you can buy a lot of your resources through drive through RPG. And then the official uh, resource site for Dungeons and Dragons is called D&D Beyond. They have a ton of stuff on there. Um, you can build characters on D&D Beyond and they kind of have a lot of resources uh, for you to do so. And in case that you were interested in getting your uh, getting your kids into it, they actually do online uh, D&D stuff now. Um, cool. So there is, uh, <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug my, my friend's stuff real quick. Uh, <laughs> my, my friend Aaron, who lives in Seattle, has started a, uh, a service called WeQuest. And what she does is she organizes a game for your kids to play digitally. So uh, she will basically work work with your kids, get everybody into a Zoom call, and run a game for them and teach them how to play uh, role playing games. So she does. Super cool. Yeah, isn't it? It's, it's super yeah. great. She does. She does some stuff with the. She does some stuff with D and D. But uh, the very first one. So she has a couple of different courses. One for younger kids, um, like. 10 and younger, and then one for teenagers, and then one for kids who want to try DMing for the first time. And what's really great about it is that she comes from an educator background. And so she's very familiar with how kids learn and how they interact. And so she's actually done a lot of work to change the rules in a way that I think are very clever and good for learning. That's um, awesome. How, and- how to play. And so she she runs the actual game. So you don't have to, none of the kids have to be the game master, right? Or the dungeon right. master. Because that's a lot, <laughs> seems like a lot to take on for your first round, at least. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a lot the first time. Um, yes, she actually runs the game mm-hmm. uh, herself. Uh, she and her, uh, I guess her now husband is um, kind of working together to uh, make this sort of thing happen. But yeah, so there's a lot of great, resources uh for dnd um and it's being adopted more and more by educators as being a great tool for learning so there's mm-hmm. there's the whole game aspect of dnd where you're building a character and a lot of that is math right so yeah your kids can learn math right they, they learn probabilities they they learn the way that you know just compounding resources will yield something greater than the actual sum of its parts. And um, it's really good for that. Uh, it's really good for social learning. Um, there's been programming, programming to help kids with um, maybe like social disabilities that have a hard yeah. time picking up on um, social cues and that kind of thing. Uh, D&D is really good for that, right? Because you're yeah, it's yeah, a cool you're... way to make friends, right? Like, so mm-hmm. we, um, you know, last year when we had in-person programming, we had a couple of teens approach us about running a D&D game for other teens, specifically so that it was all teen done. Mm-hmm. Um, and they had just a few, you know, trickle in eventually, but like, those kids are friends now. Like those teens hang out. We've seen them moving in packs here at the library and it's super adorable to like, see them bond over this oh yeah um little wars had a very successful kids D &D, um program before covid uh right (laughs) we we used to we used to run it on sundays and when when we first started it was like there was one group that came in that was interested and so we were like okay yeah you know what we can run a table on sundays so the first week we had we had one table we had six six kids in here 
the second week we had 20 uh oh, oh <laughs> it exploded uh, we just had kids running rampantly uh on on sundays <laughs> playing D D. so it's very good socially and also you have to be creative right so you're mm-hmm. you're participating in a storytelling process and so you're you're creating your character story and you're also weaving the story of your combined group um mm-hmm. there's just a lot of great benefits for playing in a role-playing game. I couldn't recommend it more. You know, I'm, I'm in two of them right now, you know, like <laughs> just, it's, uh, it's, just, it's just a great way. And especially nowadays when it's harder to interact with people on a week, it's harder, it's harder to find an excuse to interact with people on a weekly basis. Like mm-hmm. it's great for me and my friends to, you know, have a weekly reason to get on Zoom and talk to each other and be like, yeah, hey, absolutely. how you doing? You know, you're, you haven't <laughs> had to leave your house and three weeks you know like you still alive in there um and we chat and we hang out and we play we play uh pathfinder or D or whatever role-playing game that suits us so yeah okay. i th- i think for teens like by the time you're a teenager D D is a great game to get into i started playing it when i was a teenager um i, I think it's wonderful uh, i guess I, I do have so one quick thing if you're looking to get into it all of these resources are super fantastic i also have i guess a thing so uh wizards of the coast themselves also have these sets that you can pick up so if you're intimidated by getting it started into the process they sell starter sets they also have what they call an essentials kit but just like as a quick look into the starter set in case you're interested um it comes with a set of dice you technically only oh, need nice. one yeah you yeah. technically only need one a set of dice to play mm-hmm. D amongst all of the players but in general, people end up picking up their own dice because it's obnoxious to borrow dice from everybody. Um, <laughs> and, and they're cute, like yeah, they're fun they to have. Probability rocks. Yeah, <laughs> they come. They come in a lot of different styles too, mm-hmm. so it's a very personal choice. Um, secondly, uh, a, another intimidating part about playing role-playing games is building your first character. So when you mm-hmm. buy the starter kit, it actually comes with a bunch of pre-made characters. Oh, so, cool. You can just jump right into it, basically. Just be like, all right, here you are. You are this. Uh, you're a level one human fighter. You're lawful good. You were a folk hero, you mm-hmm. know. And uh, you write your write your name in here, and then just go into it. it tells you your backstory and everything, so you have oh, a kind of a character great. to build on. <laughs> so yeah, that gets through that part. And then lastly, they have a little basic starter rule set. So it's not everything you need to build your own characters, but it's enough to kind of understand the concepts in the game. Yeah. Oh, it's so cute. And then lastly, what's very intimidating about running a game is um, having a DM that will actually run the game. So they include a free adventure called Lost Mine of Fandelver. And it is uh, what they call a module. I know we talked about modules earlier. You might not have known what it was. (laughs) But essentially, it is a pre-written adventure. So the DM just has to go through and read, I guess, through the book to kind of see what's going on and it kind of creates a setting and an understanding a lot of these include maps that you can kind of show your players um, to kind of give them a better understanding of where they're going and that kind of thing so with the starter set it takes away a lot of the work running a game playing a a role-playing game can be a lot of effort Um, and when you're like fully immersed in it and you love it you know it doesn't feel like work right it, it, it's mm-hmm. fun and enjoyable but you're for, for your first time especially not really understanding everything that's going on it can be a little intimidating so the starter set kind of removes that barrier and um lets you lets you kind of just jump right into playing immediately so i love it and you did say that there are a bunch of other modules right so the modules are the pre-written storylines yeah um so if you liked playing, if you get the starter set and you like it, but then you don't really know where to go from there. Plenty, plenty of other models. So you can actually take the characters that you made and kind of fleshed out in your first starter set game and run them through many other modules. So D, uh, Wizards of the Coast themselves have um, official books that they have printed as modules to run. Um, very popular ones include, include like Curse of Strahd or Tomb Yay. of Annihilation and stuff like that. Um, so you can literally run the characters from your starter set in, into those uh, modules. They also, like I said, on on um, RPG Drive Through or Drive Through RPG and D and D Beyond, they also have other smaller modules that aren't like full books that you can buy for like 10, 15 bucks. That's cool. just 
you know, a quick one shot module, you can just go in and play real fast. So tons of resources for D and D out there, guys. If you want to, if you want to get into it, you definitely can. There's uh, <laughs> nothing stopping you, but yourself. So, <laughs> all right, let's see. What do we got next? Um, Ooh, yeah, this next game, this next game is really exciting. Okay, so when I was thinking about other games, all right, so one of the big things, and I've, I've run games for teens before because we have had um, board game clubs from high schools kind of come through the shop, and I've been given the challenging task of entertaining them for an hour <laughs> or so. Uh, <laughs> so uh, one thing that I've found about teens is that uh, I usually like to demo games for them that kind of keep them active and right. in, involved right you know like yeah. so if it takes too much you know uh they'll, they'll sometimes lose interest and just play on their phone or something mm -hmm. so this game is phenomenally fun i mean it, it's not just for teens but I, I found that you know teens play this game very well um this team this game is called team three so you're it's already a cooperative game um mm -hmm. but you, you you play in teams of three and you play versus other teams so they're so you're working together to play um i think that uh it's by brain games publishing and it is great it is a great learning tool um so in team three right you have three players and just like kind of the image on the box showed each player uh you know you know those monkeys that like like mm -hmm. one can't see one can't hear one can't speak oh. yeah so the overall goal of the game is to build one of these structures you can see in the, the top left here um, mm -hmm. using the little Tetris pieces that they provide for you. Um, but the person who can actually see what you're trying to build can't talk. So they can only <laughs> gesture what needs to happen. And the person who's actually building the, uh, the thing can't see. They have to close their eyes the entire time. And the person who can't hear is in between them trying to translate between this person who can only gesture at them and this person who can't see those gestures <laughs> and need to just figure out what's going on. Uh, and that, that's the entire game. That's um, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and you play against these other teams and they have similar difficulty uh, cards and whoever can finish their structure first wins. And it's a mess uh, and they, they love it. Um, it's it's so fun to just do uh <laughs> whenever uh, whenever i was in seattle my my friends at the house i was living at uh had this game and you know we would just crack open a couple of beers and just get going uh and it, it would, hilarity ensues right like you um so it, it's kind of it's kind of like a game of telephone right because mm -hmm. this, this communication process is trying to get down a chain of of people who are bad at their job essentially um and and it's and it's really good uh so fantastic yeah there's a there ends up being a lot of shouting um <laughs> i imagine yeah especially the from the person i know 100 <laughs> percent. <laughs> especially from the person you can't see right because the person who can't see you're just like right. what are you talking about i can't like <laughs> this is this is impossible <laughs> um but you can see you can see some of the all right so actually this picture that i put in the top left uh the difficulty is from easiest on the right to like that the card on the left would be considered a, a star three difficulty right like yeah it's like an insane christmas tree yeah like describing <laughs> to somebody how to build that you know no nope. it just it's, it would be challenging even if you could use all of your senses um mm -hmm. so yeah so do you win if you just build it? Like, is, is each team competing to build the same tower or are um, you going in turns? Yeah, so uh, if you wanted to do like a specific kind of competition, you would have each team try to build the same tower and whoever builds it the fastest wins. Um, you could also just have teams build things in a, um, in a similar category. So the cards themselves are in categories of like these are easy structures to build moderate structures difficult structures and you can just you know be like all right we're gonna do easy structures this round you draw one at random and you just go you know and <laughs> do your best to build them and yeah just so you know just like because you can see these on the uh you can see in the picture on the bottom right these structures mm -hmm. have to be standing up like they're not oh, no. they're not flat against the ground <laughs> like you actually have to 
<laughs> like so the person who can't see also has to not knock the, their own tower over or else they have to start over from the beginning so like it, it's a, a vertical structure um uh, amazing uh, yeah evil no, jenga <laughs> And that's team three. I've had a lot of success with it, uh, with, with my, with my teens. And so I, I think it'll be, I think it'll be a good, uh, good thing. Spectacular. <laughs> okay. So next up, our last game for the teens category is finger guns at high noon. So this, this continues my trend of, uh, thinking that games for teens should be engaging and fun and kind of, kind of keep them in the action the whole time. So in finger guns at high noon, your uh it, it is an active game you could all sit around the table most of the times whenever i demo the game and i play i, I ask everybody to stand up because it's just more fun yeah. um so finger guns at high noon is kind of a fast-paced uh gesture game um <laughs> so you uh all right so basically everybody kind of takes these simultaneous actions oh yeah we could actually go to the next slide and i think it'll, it'll help describe the game some so you have a list of choices that you do. And each of those choices has a gesture associated. Um, I have like kind of some samples in the bottom. So you have posse, uh, it's being covered up by the sheriff badge right now, but, um, uh, and then you have like saloon, which is like just holding up some fingers. You have shot, you know, which you're pulling out your gun and stuff. <laughs> and so basically the, the game takes place in, in two, phases in the first phase you all shout and argue at each other about what you're going to do there's no <laughs> <laughs> there's no actual accountability for what you end up doing but you basically try to build factions because at the end of the game uh the last two players alive live so there's actually a reason to try to work together so you can try to like build your factions and be like, Hey, you know, you and me, we can, we can make it to the end of this and win, you know, everybody else. Yeah. We can live. <laughs> um, and so you argue about what you're going to do. And then whenever it's time, when people are essentially tired of arguing, somebody can grab the sheriff badge and they can be like, all right, it's high noon. We're going to shoot one, two, three. And at the end of the count, you have to do the gesture of the thing that you want to do um there's there's lasso so you gotta like kind of do this like lasso thing you got like a shoot or you got like a big shot uh kind of hand thing and what adds a little bit of extra depth is that all of the actions are resolved in order by priority so um you resolve from the top of the list down so posse gets resolved first and then saloon saloon is healing so you can choose to heal yourself um okay. shot is just shooting somebody and they take they take two damage um Everybody starts with 20 life. It's just, it's just so fun and chaotic. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of backstabbing involved. Uh, most <laughs> of the actions can't happen if somebody else also takes that action. Oh, so okay. like with saloon, you can heal for four life, but if anybody else is holding up four fingers, then neither one of you heal. Oh, devious. Right? Okay. Yeah. So there's like, so you can, if you think somebody's trying to heal and you want to block them, you can just be oh. like, you know, so there's, there's a lot of nuance um, to the game, so. Some politicking. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, there's a lot of shouting and politicking. Um, on the right here, I've shown some ally cards. So to make the game a little bit more interesting with rule breaking asymmetrical card stuff, um, if you're the only person that lassos, you basically wrangle in an ally and the ally does something special for you. Um, like the Tyson twins, if you, if you wrangle that in, you and somebody else gains four life. So, and stuff like that. So it has a little bit of extra depth to the game, but like I said, super fun and just a lot of shout, a lot of shouting and politicking. And then uh, honestly, the best seller for finger guns at high noon is a game of finger guns at high noon being played <laughs> because it's so loud and rowdy and boisterous and fun that you just are like, what's happening? Like what, what is, what is going on over here? And you're like, yeah, we're playing finger guns and um, you know, and with a great thing with this game too is that when you die, uh, you become a ghost and you still get to do stuff. So like you're not oh. out of you're not out of the game. So the ghosts, right. yeah, the ghosts can block healing. They can't heal themselves, but they can be like, oh, you're trying to you trying to you trying to heal, you know? <laughs> um, no, join the ghost squad. <laughs> <laughs> and they they also can uh, shoot stuff. They they, they haunt the you know the uh, uh, the surviving players. And so, um, so you still have to try to appeal to them. So just because you killed somebody, you know, they might, they might come back, you <laughs> they know, can to, come for their revenge. They can come for their revenge. Uh, so it's, 
it's fun and uh keeps you active but yeah those are the team games i got uh i have personally tested them all with teens and you know they love it so it's... they sound crazy fun <laughs> yep 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 all right i think we're we got 15 minutes left so we should probably yeah burn through get to our last category here so games for adults um this was by far by far the most difficult category for me to make games for because once you're an adult or really even like 17 and older you can comprehend any rule set that is kind of put in front of you so it's now less about you know whether or not you can understand what's happening and more about like well you know are you gonna like it (laughs) yeah are you gonna like it so um (laughs) i decided to do this game by some categories this uh, this uh section by some categories that i think um i guess older people enjoy (laughs) absolutely all right yeah so my first category is word games um in general i have found that word games don't work as well for kids and teens um, because there's a bit more there's there's a lot more social nuance in word games Um, a lot of them are aided by how well you know a person Mm -hmm. um and then there's like some typically more sophisticated wordplay just in general like the kind of trivia and understanding you have to under to know to be fluent in word games is a bit higher so i usually reserve word games for a group of adults but makes sense yeah but in general in terms of uh games for adults they're very approachable uh people love word games they're they're fun they're they're fun um this one in particular has been doing very well for me this game is called medium uh i believe it came out last year uh medium by greater than games i actually have a copy of it here so i guess i can pull it out for us to look at set this up i gotta switch my camera over (laughs) (laughs) here we go yeah so in medium and this will be kind of a fun thing because I, I think you and i can play a round of medium uh, uh-huh. over this over this call right here so uh medium is co- they call it the mind reading party game and is such a devilishly simple concept uh basically with medium everybody has a hand has, has a hand of cards and their goal is to try to read the other person's mind <laughs> okay uh so it it sounds weird but i've actually played this game a lot and it's it's not as weird as you think um so there's there's some tokens that come in the box these tokens basically give you points but they give you uh they give you secret points so you Mm -hmm. and your team member has a secret amount of points um so that you can't just like know who's winning at all times nice Um, so that's what that's there for um it comes with dividers so the box is very well built so that um it it comes with dividers for you to organize your box after you're done playing uh which i very much appreciate uh board games used to not be like this it used to just be an empty (laughs) box and uh you just had to throw a bunch of stuff um in there a mess rattling around yeah but now uh board game designers have gone through the extra effort of making sure that their games are easy to put away and well organized so um it comes with some dividers and some special cards but all medium is is a bunch of cards that they have hand selected that has words on them and they've uh hand selected them into different categories because they think that these words would work well together (laughs) for this game uh I don't know for sure. I haven't actually spoken to the creator of this game, but I'm pretty certain that they decided to put words together that make no sense to make the game harder and, and more difficult. So, <laughs> all right. So here's here's how the game is played. And I, th- I think you'll find this very fun. Um, it seems like a great library game in, in general. Excited. Yeah. So you would have like a hand, you would have a hand of cards and it would have all these cards that have random words on it. So I'd, I'd have a hand too, right? And our goal is to try to come up with the same word at the same time um, between the cards that we choose. So one of us would pick a would pick a card first. Uh, I know you're reading these kind of weirdly. Is there <laughs> is there a card out of your hand that you would want to put forward? Uh, yeah. Let's go with ant. Ant, awesome. So you would put the card ant on the table, and I would be like, oh, okay. 
uh, I would look at my hands. And so my, our goal would be to have two words and then I would have, to, we would try to come up with a word that is the medium of those two words and say them at the same time. Um, so with <laughs> ants, uh, here, so I'll put down, I'll put down banana. And by, by medium, um, it's pretty, what's the word I'm looking for? It's pretty generous. So mm -hmm. like in, in their box example, they would say something like, uh, you know, a medium would be like, if some, if you put the word big and I put the word small, the medium would be medium. But right. like, if you put, let's say, um, if you put like beach and I put, I don't know, volleyball, then a medium between those two could be sand, right? Like, cause they, they both have those things. Does that make sense? Yeah, so. absolutely. All right. Something so, that combines, connects the two somehow. All right. So you put ant, I put banana. So I'm going to count to three and then we're both going to say a word and we're going to try to say the same word. All right. You ready? I'm ready. All right. One, two, three. Picnic. Banana slug. Oh no. Banana slug. All right. Cool. All right. So <laughs> we didn't get it on the first try. Um, so basically what we would do now is we would try to get the medium between the word you just said, banana slug and picnic. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> and we, we can't say any of the words that have already been said or the words that started the thing. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you have banana slug. I have picnic. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. All right. I have a word, but okay. you, know, you um, got a word? Um, hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, sure. Where, uh, sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Let's try it again. Ready? Three, two, one. Pass. Gross. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, th those are pretty close. We're, we're honing in. So we have yeah. one more try. We have one more try. So you'll notice that these, uh, these things, uh, the point things have a Roman numerals on them, one, two, and three. Okay. So yeah. if we get it on our first try, we get the most points. We get five uh. or six points. If we got it on our second try, then we get a moderate amount. And if we get it on the third try, we get the least amount, but you know, we still got it. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you don't get it after three tries, then you, you just don't get it. So, <laughs> all right. So the word was gross and pest. Pest. Okay. Okay. All right. I think, I think I got it. This is, it's pretty common. Okay. Okay. I got one too. All right. <laughs> we'll here see. you go. You ready? Ready. <laughs> three, two, one. Mosquito. Cockroach. Oh, oh no. Okay. All right. But that's <laughs> All right. And that, you know, so we wouldn't have gotten any points, but that's fine. And then the play would just keep passing around and you keep going. Um, you draw, you draw more cards. So you have more options to try to choose. So some of them are pretty easy. Um, I've played a game where, uh, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> it's so I, hard. I, yeah, it is. It is a difficult <laughs> game, but it's really fun because like the more you play it, the better you get at it. Mm -hmm. you know and so like uh i played a game where uh sometimes it's just ridiculous and you get to just hound somebody uh <laughs> relentlessly for for their choices but like Absolutely. i think like one, one time i was playing a game and the card that i played uh they played the card canada mm -hmm. and so and i played the card tree and so i was okay. like oh okay well this is they're obviously talking about maple yeah yeah so i said maple he said pine and I was like, what? I was like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> like, the famous Canada pine. The famous Canada pine. Obviously. Um, the so oh. this this game is just so much fun. And the like I said, the first time you play it, it it's it's funny because nobody gets it. Like uh mm -hmm. it, it you kind of have to get into a good mindset for it, but like after you play it for a couple of rounds, it starts getting easier and you kind of understand what people are going for. Um <laughs> And you kind of you kind of get to know each other better too, right? You're like, right. okay, yeah, you know, Darcy's the kind of person that says banana slug. <laughs> I get it, you know. <laughs> like, Fine. <laughs> so, that makes sense. I love it. Yeah, that's medium, and it's it's so simple and easy. This is a good um, this is a good wine game, you know. Like, it's a good just like hang out, eat some food, drink some drinks, and just play medium. It's a yeah. good background game. You can chat over it. 
usually the two people who are playing because you, you play it you 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 rotate around your group mm -hmm. so the two people who are playing they'll um you know just kind of like think and commiserate <laughs> for a while about how they, they can't quite get on the same uh, wavelength and so everybody else can just kind of chat and drink and have, have a good time. So this make fun of Canadian pines, make fun of Canadian pines. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this, this was my recommendation. I think I put on some other word games in case people were from, uh, wanted to see some other stuff. Code names is one that people are very familiar with usually in terms of word games. Um, Decrypto is also a really good one. Um, it's, it's, I actually like Decrypto a little bit more than code names. Cause I think it requires a bit more teamwork. Ooh, okay. um and code names does and then trap words is like um it's like reverse taboo um oh. so if you're familiar with taboo you're trying to get your teammates to guess a word and there's these words you can't say mm -hmm. so in trap words it's exactly that except the words that you can't say are written by the other team oh nice and that's sneaky they're they're written by the other team and you don't know what they are <laughs> oh, no. So you have to try your best to be like, well, I think the other team wrote these words down, so I'm not going to say those. And the other team is also being like, oh, okay, he's a, uh, you know, yeah. So you're, there's a lot of, um, yeah, it's really clever. It's a really clever twist on a, on an old game. Um, I love really it. Good. And you get to harass people about saying the wrong words that they don't even know. Yeah. Pushing the buzzer of taboo, taboo was always like yeah. the fun part. <laughs> I mean, it was all fun, <laughs> but it's it exceptionally awesome. fun to harass your friends. Yeah, let's see some good word games. All right, let's see. Let's look at the next category. All right, games for adults. Um, I felt like I needed to go ahead and include um, games that were centric for adults. I think now more than ever, people are making games for an older audience. Um, this is something that would have been unheard of 15 years ago, right? Like, right. <laughs> games are for kids, you know? Um, so. <laughs> Uh, now people are making games marketed for adults to play. Uh, and so uh, one of those games that I really enjoy is a game called Trial by Trolley. Um, so I'm, I think most people are familiar with the whole trolley problem, right? Yes. Like, like there's a, you know, like, would you do this or, you know, pull the lever and not do that? And so in Trial by Trolley, it's a judge-based game. So one person is the trolley driver. And the rest of the players are separated into two teams and um, they each put, like they draw out of a deck of cards and they put things on the trolley for their side to try to incentivize, either incentivize the trolley driver to not drive over them or to incentivize the trolley player to drive over the other side. So <laughs> they're, they're innocent <laughs> cards. Uh, so the innocent cards you might put down would be like, oh, you know, Mother Teresa's on my trolley. And there's also, <laughs> a time machine on my track, you know? And then somebody with evil cards might be like, yeah, but like reincarnated Hitler is also on your train track, you know, like, so. <laughs> oh, so you can play on either side of the train track. It's not like this is mine, that's yours, other than for points. Yeah, so you play good cards on your side and you play mm -hmm. evil cards on their side to try to make it more enticing to run over that side. Uh, um, and then there are, there are modifier cards uh, as well um, that modify the cards that are on the track. That's pretty fun. So uh, an example of that would be like, um, I played an evil card on, on the opposite track for the judge. And that evil card was, uh, you know, your racist uncle. <laughs> so he would be like, oh yeah, I mean, that guy's kind of a jerk, but you know, I don't want to, you know, whatever. I don't, I, don't, I don't need to run him over with a trolley. Mm -hmm. And then I played a modifier that was like, and he has a 90% chance of winning the next presidential election. And he's like, oh, okay, oh, yeah, no. he has to die. <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, kind of thing. So this is definitely a game geared for adults. It has some adult themes. Mm -hmm. And it, at the end of the day, you are choosing a, a group of people to run over with a trolley. So uh, <laughs> fictionally, fictionally run fictionally. over with a trolley. Um, and it, it, it's it's great because you also you also end up just talking about like, oh, like why would you you argue? You over, chose that. Yeah, you you argue over which track is better to run over um and, and that's and, and that's the main course of the game play moves around until everybody has judged the once and then the people who died the least would uh will win the game um it's a very it's a very fun game uh it's, it's fun <laughs> to just argue and the cards that they have for it are just absolutely ridiculous um so uh, definitely good i included some uh, other adult games to to look at on the next slide 
Um, I think most people are familiar with Cards Against Humanity. Absolutely. A game that also has adult themes. They've also been making just like not safe, not safe for work versions of regular games now too. Like <laughs> Unstable Unicorns was just a game that people liked. And they're mm-hmm. like, hey, you know, like this is a fun version, you know, for for more adult themes. <laughs> Make it saucy. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, some people call it a cheap marketing ploy. You know, other people are like, oh, this is fun and neat and funny. Um, another game that I threw on there for adult games is uh, Fog of Love. Um, I don't know if you've heard of this game, but nope. it is it is a rom com board game. So it's not necessarily <laughs> like it's not like dirty, you know, mm-hmm. um, like. I think a teenager could play it, but they just wouldn't get it because, you know, there's yeah. just a lot of, it, there's a lot of funny themes on there. So in Fog of Love, you're, uh, it's a two player game only. So you play with this other person and you're uh, pursuing this romantic relationship, but you have, uh, you draw all these random quirks and stuff that you would probably hate about a person that you were gonna you were gonna be with um it just ends up being hilarious it's just really funny and you uh basically you go you draw these social situation cards and you you and your partner choose what you would do out of a out of a um a multiple choice like you know uh you go to a party what do you do well you know i i drink the punch and mingle or i i punch the host or i I do do a line of cocaine on the toilet or something you know like there's just a lot of uh so you choose what you do and then based on those choices you get you get points um and it's it's just really really funny uh game that was obviously geared towards people who love rom-coms they have a lot of rom-com tropes in there like Mm -hmm. oh you know your your husband's ex-wife shows up and uh (laughs) she's now just like getting drunk and making a fool of herself like what do you do kind of kind of thing um fans for fans of the telenovela Mm -hmm. and the the nice paperback romances yeah i can definitely see why this one would be for adults <laughs> yeah but fun it's it's, yeah. it's it's really it's really good um okay so then our last category for um ga- games for adults was i wanted to just do a nod to very complex games um mm-hmm. or i would again these games are accessible enough that anybody would be able to understand and play them but they just take a little bit more time and patience and just a lot of gamey nuance that isn't that isn't for everyone. I mean, I know plenty of adults right. who just don't want to sit down and play a game for eight hours, but you know, this is what <laughs> this is where we're at. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the game that I put on the front of this is a game that's dear to my heart, Twilight Imperium. Uh, it kind of, in my opinion, really revolutionized board games a little bit, um, and I like it a lot. I've played it a ton. It is a notoriously long game. Like we're talking. <laughs> an hour to two hours per player so in a full six person <laughs> game you know you're playing six to 12 hours Oof. of this thing very long game um we can move to the next slide i'm not going to describe to you i'm not going to try to teach you how to play twilight imperium because it's way too complicated but Fair. <laughs> in general you know you play the civilization that's you know the space civilization and there's a ton of different ways to win uh you guys also convene for this um like space politics right like all the races meet up and you kind of discuss the uh you discuss it's the NATO. yeah right <laughs> you just you discuss the different like mandates and laws and rules that you're going to use to govern like it's it's that kind of game um you have secret agendas you go out and you colonize planets uh you can interact diplomatically you can also just you know build a bunch of warships and blow up other people's stuff it is a very involved game um not for everybody for sure uh but for the so, hardcore sci-fi crunchy people, like it's fun. Absolutely. It looks fun. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're if you're willing to sit down and like play it, it's fun. It's a good, it's a good time, you know. Um, I put a bunch of a handful of other complex games on 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 the next slide. Uh, again, these games are not on a like anybody anybody who is an adult could know how to play these games. They just yeah. require a bit more to do. You have to. Uh, a lot of these games take an hour for you to set up and break them down, you know, because like you have to like set up a bunch of stuff. Like Gloomhaven's a fantastic yeah. game; it's been very popular. It's basically a role playing game in a box, so you don't you don't need a uh, you don't need a DM, and you do all these dungeon crawls. But the game has a lot of setup, so if you don't have the patience for that, it can be kind of difficult. You have to set yeah. up these dungeons. You have to pull out your old characters, shuffle a bunch of cards, that kind of thing. Feast for Odin is a very crunchy Euro game. Um, super fun, Lord of the Rings, that kind of stuff. So there's a ton of these out there, guys. Uh, so 
if you if you like if you're if you're the kind of person that plays these games, it's more than likely you know more about board games than I do already. So, you know, just <laughs> take take these opinions with a grain of salt. You know, there's just a bunch of a bunch of games out there for, for people to play. But I thought or I would if just they're, throw it out If there. they're excited about this kind of game, they can pester you. They can oh, come absolutely. find you. I mean, yeah, you can definitely ask me about it. Um, I'm always I'm always on the circuit of like looking at all the newest games that are coming out, games on Kickstarter, games that are not yet published that are kind of hitting the market. So if you have any questions at all, you can always email or call or, you know, let me know and I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, yeah, so that's all we had for today. We're more or less on time. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I put this cheesy little ad for <laughs> a I little worse. I love it. On, on the right here. Um, Make it, make it a game night. Yeah, uh, you can't play games in our store currently, but you know you can come mm. and pick up a board game and uh, play play at home. We're located right over here at Jefferson, uh, actually right next to the main library. Uh, yeah. so <laughs> Convenient. And, yeah, and uh, you can also order. We have our most of our board game catalog online on our website as well, littlewars.com. So you can always order for a, for a curbside pickup. We'll bring the games out to you. Oh, that's um, lovely. Yeah, absolutely. So, nice. so we're. Doing, doing it the best we can. Nice. And so the best place to find that stuff is either to call you guys or the website or is there social media? Yeah, you can find everything at littlewars.com. All of our social media links are on littlewars.com. We do a lot of advertising through Facebook mm -hmm. and stuff. So if you like us on Facebook as well, we, we do uh, unboxing videos of new, uh, new okay. games and things that are coming out. And um, we more or less just let people know what's going on. So yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Your PowerPoint was delightful. Oh, I could you. not tell. It has been a long time. <laughs> it's good PowerPoint. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. So we have a couple of library resources to plug. Um, if you are interested in RPGs, we do have uh, in our stacks a couple of copies of like the Player's Handbook for D&D &D mm -hmm. 4th and 5th edition. If you're not, if you want to look through it, but you're not quite willing to make that first plunge into buying it yet. I think we also have a Pathfinder player's handbook. So there's a little bit that we have, but not a ton. And then um, as soon as we're able to restart our regular gaming program, we normally do like monthly board game nights. Um, I know y'all do a much similar thing. Um, thank you guys, our patrons so much for being patient. <laughs> we're restarting them as soon as we can figure out the safest way to do it basically. Um, but yeah. So join us back here on uh, the day after tomorrow, right? Thursday, Thursday. November 12th. Yes, at 6.30. And we will be doing games by number of players, right? Yep, games by numbers. Yeah. Yes, exciting. So if you've enjoyed this program, please feel free to visit our Facebook page, um, which you're on right now if you're watching us live, uh, for upcoming programs and the library's YouTube channel, which is EBRP Library TV. Uh, we upload all of our live virtual programs to YouTube, so you can rewatch those over and over again. Uh, yeah. And then you can always head to our website, www.ebrpl.com, to find out all sorts of cool library things. So thank you so much for watching. And Ben, thank you so much for being here tonight. This has been great. Uh, this, is, this is the funnest thing I've done in a long time. So. Yay. Well, we're excited to see you on Thursday. Yeah, I'll be here. Yeah. All right. See you guys later. Bye. Bye.